tonight from London on It's a Miracle. After days of battling heavy winds on the open sea, two sailors retire for the night, leaving their boat to sail its own course. I knew that as long as you were well away from hazards, that it was fairly safe to let the boat sail herself through the night. But where she took them can only be described as a miracle. You've heard of Siamese twins. Now meet a pair of British twins whose lives are so connected that their hearts truly beat as one. These stories and more on this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle, a miracle. Happening to everyday people. Changing their lives forever. It's a miracle. And now from London, England, here's your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to a special edition of It's a Miracle. I'm here in front of one of London's most famous landmarks, the Houses of Parliament. Tsar Nicholas of Russia called this remarkable edifice a dream in stone. And for nearly a thousand years, it was the seat of government for a vast empire that spanned the globe. So it seems fitting place to begin a story that takes us from Great Britain on an amazing journey halfway around the world, a journey that ends in a miracle. In 1992, John Beattie gave up his teaching position in Middlesbrough, England, to pursue his dream, sailing around the world on his 35-foot sloop, the Warrior Queen. The boat was a fine, seaworthy boat, but she didn't have things like sonar or radar or a long-distance radio. This was a plain, simple sailing boat. Despite its name, the Warrior Queen was no match for the unpredictable power of the Atlantic Ocean. I had very bad weather most of the time. If you're in a really bad sea in a small boat, she lurches from side to side, she pitches up and down, she gets flooded by waves, you're permanently soaked, and if the water's cold, you're frozen right to the bone. John quickly learned a basic lesson of survival. A tired sailor must trust the winds to guide his boat while he sleeps below. And the hard thing to do is to settle into that and realize you can sleep and leave the boat to plow through the night on its own. By the time he reached Venezuela, John's dream of circumnavigating the globe had changed. I made the decision that I would settle for a one-year circuit of the Atlantic Ocean, which would take me from Ireland down to South America and back up through the Caribbean and home. But once I decided that uh, I was going to settle for a one-year trip, I decided to pick up some other crew. So I came across a, a, a Kiwi, a New Zealander, called Hamish Scott. He joined me on my boat. It turned out to be a first-rate crew member. But uh, I still had problems with the boat. Bad water pumps too bad, John. Yeah. We had a water cooling pump for the engine that had stopped working. We couldn't fix it. So we spent days trying to find a replacement and eventually made do without. They set sail from Caracas to Antigua, a distance of 600 miles. But from the very start, the winds were against them. The course was roughly northeast. But because the wind was coming more or less from the northeast, we had to kind of tack all the time, and uh, it was slow progress. For three days, the sailors worked constantly with little or no sleep to keep roughly on course. Okay, ready, bite, Lee Ho! Hey! On the third night, John recalled the lesson he'd learned on the Atlantic and decided it was time both men got some well-deserved rest. Well, that's it. Nothing to worry about. We'll see you in the morning, OK? Oh, yeah. Kill the lights before you go to sleep. Yeah, in the window. And I knew that as long as you were well away from hazards and well away from shipping lanes and hundreds of miles from land, that it was fairly safe to sleep and let the boat sail herself through the night. As they slept, the warrior queen took her own course. And at dawn, Hamish was the first to wake. I woke thinking I'd heard a, a man crying for help. And I lifted my head and 
put it back down again. I thought, no, no, it couldn't have been a man. Well, it must, must be a seabird or something like that, because, you know, there's no chance anyone could be out here. And, and then I heard it again. So I got up, climbed up the companionway and looked out and here was this guy waving his arms, yelling out in an open, open boat. Hey, John! As soon as I heard the knocking, I jumped out of the, the, the little cabin, looked out over the side of the boat, and there in a little open boat was a man standing up and trying to attract our attention. Now, for the first time ever in my life, I literally could not believe my own eyes. Was the man in the boat real or an hallucination? Was this an ambush or a desperate warning? An angel or a ghost? The amazing answer when it's a miracle returns. After three days of fighting winds that were pushing them off course, John Beatty and Hamish Scott decided to let their boat sail where it may while they got a good night's sleep. During the night, the winds guided the warrior queen to the only other boat within hundreds of miles. On it, a man as thin as a ghost. But it wasn't a ghost they were seeing. It was a living miracle, and his name was Martin Simon. Nine days earlier, Martin and his friend Rodney were returning to Grenada from an offshore island when their boat ran out of gas. And finally, when the engine cord broke, they knew they you were in now. serious trouble. Boy, you see now, now you're breaking the thing. Now we're stuck yeah. out here. That way, you see, I didn't want to pull it so hard enough to get. The current began pulling them farther and farther away from shore. We dropped an anchor, but we didn't have enough rope. So the boat kept drifting. But we left the anchor in the water safe in case it made a shallow part, they're going to stick. But that didn't happen. By the next day, the two men were reported missing, and a massive search began. But the only plane that flew near them failed to see them below. Rodney we had a yellow coat, and he keep waving, waving the yellow coat. And I said, Rodney, well, make no sense you're waving no more, because then they can't see us. So just sit down and relax yourself, you know? You just got to prepare for what come. But nothing could prepare them for day after day in the boiling sun and a terrible thirst that couldn't be quenched. There's no way we could get water and food there, so I take my mind off of that. But Roddy didn't have his mind off. We had a 16-ounce bottle, and he would fill that 16-ounce bottle of water and drink salt water every day. Every day. And I used to say, Roddy, that's bad for you. Stop drinking that salt water. It's good water, man. Ain't nothing wrong with the water. But Rodney wouldn't listen and continued to drink from the ocean. His movements and his, his speech started to go. You see that? On the sixth day, he died just like that. For the next two days, Martin kept his friend's dead body with him in the boat. But near the end, he was forced to bury him at sea, floating the body in hopes that someone might find it. I did that and watched the body just sail away. And from that, then horror take me. Because the whole night, I just can't sleep. The next 24 hours were a mixture of nightmare and reality. At one point, voices told Martin to jump overboard, but at the last moment, he resisted. Sit in the house, come back in the boat, and started to pray again to ask God for help. Then the morning when I get up, in the horizon, I could see something like an angel, a white thing just appeared to me. It was a boat. But to me, it was like an angel coming up. That boat was guided straight to me. As I said, my prayer was answered. Martin began calling out for help, but no one responded. And as the boat drew nearer, it was his turn to imagine that it was nothing but a ghost ship. And when I looked, there's nobody in the boat. I said, God, well, what's going to take place now? That's my only hope. 
Just then, a man appeared on deck and just as quickly disappeared below. So I said, Lord, you know this guy go? He just passed me. You know he's going to leave me and go in truth? But John and Hamish had no intention of leaving. By now, we had passed this boat. I started the engine. I swung the bow around and started to motor back towards him. Unfortunately, the engine was working fine at this stage. We had sailed to within feet of each other in an area, literally, bigger than the size of Texas. So I suppose if you wanted to make a comparison, it would be like there's one person living in Texas and you set out to walk across Texas and you happen to come across each other in the middle of Texas while one is sleeping. And at that time, I just didn't know what to say. But I just thought, we gotta get this guy, and we gotta try and take care of him. Eventually, I got him close enough and under control, and I told him to jump. I don't know where he got the strength to do this from, but he managed to summon up the strength to lean forward and leap towards my boat. And I fell back, and as I fell back, he came over the rail, and that was it. We had him on board. Give me some water, Hamish. I knew that this was a man who was very much on the edge of life. I was conscious there and then that had we not came across him, that he would have died that day for certain. I mean, his heart and his spirit and his body would have broken. Three days later, the warrior queen entered a harbor in Antigua. Martin Simon was taken to the hospital where he remained for six weeks until he was completely recovered. During that time, another miracle occurred in his life. He met his wife-to-be, Karen. I met her in the hospital. Uh, we became friends and we got married. Now I got two kids and my wife. She is a therapist and I continue doing my diving as usual. And now she's pregnant and another baby, it's our baby. <laughs> it's been seven years since Martin has seen the men who saved his life, and it's a miracle arranged to bring them back together. Good to see you. Oh, Good to see you, you're looking well. Oh, you look good. You're not as skinny as what you were last time. Together again, all three men pondered the miraculous circumstances that joined their lives. How did that yacht come in that direction? And I said, because God made it happen that way. Because I pray a lot about that. I'm a pray answered. He couldn't have come, but he sent an angel to guide me at the time. And the angel was a warrior queen, captained by John Beatty and Hemish Scott. I'm a mathematics professor, and my specialty is probability theory. And I figured that the chances of these two little boats coming across each other hundreds of miles from land in the open Caribbean were literally less than the chance of winning the national lottery. But you win the lottery and you become a millionaire, but this man won his particular personal lottery and he had literally a second life. And I think that's a bigger prize. I'd call this whole situation just a miracle. There was just so many things that had to come together. All the elements of the current, the sea, the the fact that we came close enough for him to yell out to wake me up. It's just unbelievable. You could call it coincidence, but uh, it's something bigger than that. It's a miracle. The complete story of John Beatty's incredible voyage can be found in his book, The Breath of Angels, published by Sheridan House. Look for it at your local bookstore. We'll be right back. Coming up. Natural born enemies develop an unnatural relationship that surprises even veterinary professionals. I've never seen it before in the 13 years I've been working here, never heard of it before. 
and you may never see it again, except here on It's a Miracle. Stay with us. It's a Miracle, nominated for the Epiphany Prize from Movie Guide magazine, continues now from London, England, with your host, Richard Thomas. We recently ran our second Search for Miracles campaign, and while it was confined to America, we received one submission with true international appeal. Doesn't matter where you live or what language you speak, when you see the real footage that Anne and Wallace Calido sent us, it'll touch your heart and make you aware how sometimes even nature performs miracles. Wallace and Ann Colito live on the outskirts of North Attleboro, Massachusetts. They are, and have always been, fond of animals. I've been married 51 years, and I don't think it have been a week without a cat. Cats, I don't mind cats at all. One day, while sitting on their porch, the Colitos saw a stray kitten walking past the edge of their yard. This was a kitten that wasn't much more than, I'd say, three or four months old. A couple of days later, they saw it again. But this time, it wasn't alone. And who was with him but a crow? It can't be. A crow and a kitten? No, no. I said, my God, a crow? A crow and a kitten? It's impossible. And I said, my wife, there's a cat and a crow running down the road. We figured maybe the, the crow was chasing them, but they were side by side, not one behind each other, just side by side. I said, they must be friends. Worried that the kitten would starve, Anne put out some food for it. But the next time she saw it, she realized her worries had been for naught. The cat was laying down, and the crow was picking things up out of the grass to feed him. He looked like he has a worm or something. And actually, he was feeding the cat. Oh, my God, he's taking care of the kitten. We were shocked because the crow, um, they're supposed to eat anything that's got fur on it. And um, all of a sudden, he was feeding the kitten and caring for the kitten and bringing it to the water and doing all sorts of things that a crow shouldn't do. I know birds and cats are not friends. I don't care what kind of a cat or what kind of a bird it is. You, you just don't see things like that. Anne immediately called her veterinarian to ask for advice and spoke with the office manager, Jane Dash. Animal Clinic, can I help you? It's Mrs. Colito. Hi, Mrs. Colito, how are you? I have a, a she said there was a stray the kitten and that was in the yard and she mentioned about a bird kept coming, a bird kept coming. It's a big pro, following him all over the yard, feeding him. She said, it's feeding the kitten, you know, and it's protecting the kitten. The bird is protecting the kitten, is that what you're saying? I didn't believe it, but the customer's always right, so I just went along with it, okay, okay. Jane relayed Anne's story to veterinary doctor Kafur Maiman. I don't think it was possible. That was my belief that I have not heard, not seen, never a crow feeding the cat, never. Big bird. Dr. Maiman called so Anne bad. back to hear her story well, firsthand. I said, Mrs. Kalito, you know, if you think what you are telling is correct, you got to document it because nobody will believe in these days and time. The Kalitos took the good doctor's advice, and for the next eight months, they videotaped the amazing relationship between these two natural born enemies. What they recorded was the daily routine of a bird looking after and caring for a motherless kitten. It's amazing. You have to sit there and you're dumbfounded when you see it. There's no question about it. You're just dumbfounded. He's going to give it to the kid. Both drinking. He kept that cat alive. We don't know how long. So we surmised that the crow saved the cat. Eventually, Anne decided to see what would happen if she gave the kitten cat food instead of its regular diet of worms and bugs. The crow and the cat went out there, both together, eating the food. But the crow, he'd grab a mouthful and step back a couple inches, and he'd gobble it his up, you know? But then the cat would keep on eating. The crow would come in and grab another piece and take off. 
but he always made sure that the cat would eat his share. He won't get out of the road, will he, honey? They also discovered that the crow was very protective of the kitten. When they start crossing the road, the crow would holler, don't go on the road, you're going to get hurt. Sometimes he'd get in front of it and kind of push her back to the sidewalk. He was protecting her, see? And because they were so friendly. And it's their unlikely friendship you. that comes across most vividly in the tapes. For hours each day, they would tease, torment, and play with each other. <laughs> when Dr. Maiman and Jane Tash were finally shown the tapes, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. The bird was acting like the kitten's mother, you know, picking things off the grass and then putting it in the mouth. And the kitten, of course, play. Everything's play. I've never seen it before in the 13 years I've been working here. Never heard of it before. The only theory I would say is that they were both young and they did not know any better. It's the mother instinct in the crow. As the months passed, Anne gained the confidence of the cat she'd named Cassie and it would spend nights in the house. But every morning, the bird would be there, waiting. The bird trusted me because she looked right in at me and she would crow and crow until I let Cassie out. She was fine when I let Cassie out. We let open the door and the crow and the cat walked down the stairs together, took off to get and play together again. It had to be <laughs> what do you call a cat and a bird? Love, uh, uh, friendship, or what, you know? Best friends. Best friends. Perhaps there's a lesson we can all learn from this incredible relationship. If you're able to gain trust in someone or something or each other, then anything is possible. The crow gained confidence playing mother to this kitten, and the kitten trusted the crow, which was the only mother figure in the kitten's world. It's a miracle because he knew that the kitten needed help, and he was there. If it wasn't for the crow, feeding that cat, taking care of that cat would have been dead a long time ago. Even the vet says, if it wasn't for the crow, this cat wouldn't be here. We could learn a lot. They said, be friendly with your neighbors, not even your neighbors, the people you know and don't know. Be friendly with them. Because if a crow can take care of a kitten, it shows that two strangers meeting can get along with each other. No question about it. Another British miracle right after this. One of the main reasons that we've traveled so far from home for this edition of It's a Miracle is to cover the story of perhaps the world's youngest miracle worker. She's 11 months old, lives with her family in northern England, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. Her miraculous story actually begins before she was even born. The city of Newcastle an industrial center in northern England, is home to Janice Topping and Paul Bruce, a young couple who more than anything wanted to be parents. I've always liked children, I've always wanted children, and we just really, really wanted to make a family and give grandma and granddad the grandchildren they've always wanted. Have a nice cup of tea, you feel better. Okay. But after suffering two miscarriages, Janice's confidence was shaken. I always thought that I was going to keep having miscarriages, so every time that I did fall pregnant, I used to think, hmm, is it going to work? Is it going to work? What's the matter? I'm just nervous. And so it was with some worry and trepidation that they faced her third pregnancy, not knowing the odds would soon double against them. OK, I see two. Two what? You've got twins. <laughs> when we actually found out there were two, it was just absolutely fantastic. And we just keep saying to ourselves, where we lost two, we gained two. I was very happy, but like, 
It was a bit of a shock. There's one. There's the other. It was shocking, but it was absolutely fabulous. Really, really good. Oh, that's unusual. The ultrasound tests also revealed a very remarkable relationship forming between the twins. They're facing each other head to head. Usually, when twins are lying in the womb, one of them's head up and one of them's breech. But my two, no, they had to be head by head all the time. You could see them touching each other's faces, holding each other's hands. Um, they were just so close all the way through. You're out, love. What's the matter? The pregnancy proceeded smoothly until the fifth the month, memory? when Janice's condition suddenly took a turn for the worse. Is it the babies? She developed pre-eclampsia, an illness that can prove fatal to both mother and children. That's the kind of thing where, yeah, kidneys don't work properly, your liver doesn't work okay. properly, and you end up with toxins in your blood. Well, I think we'd better get you to the hospital. Come on. It's very, very stressful watching her go through all the pain, not being able to move properly with all the toxins you had in her. To make matters worse, Janice refused any treatment that could potentially harm the twins, and her condition steadily deteriorated. I know you've lost two babies, and you obviously don't want to lose these. I want to wait. <sighs> I got the stage where my blood pressure went sky high, and I couldn't even walk. I was so ill. Just keep on saying, don't let the twins die, let me die. And I didn't want that. If we did lose the twins, I don't think I could have coped. And I would have much rather not be here if the twins had to die. Janice was admitted to the hospital, where she was told that the only hope to save her life and the lives of her babies was to deliver them immediately. Janice, if we don't deliver them now, both your life and their lives are at risk. The doctors only give us 50-50 chance whether the twins would live or die. It was very hard because I didn't know if I was going to lose the whole three of them. You don't know what my feelings are, and I know that I can hold on for these babies to survive a little bit longer. Sometimes when I was lying there, I just didn't believe it was me going through all this heartache and whether I was going to come out of this because I'd been through so much pain. Well, your life my family. and their life is my concern, and I'm being irresponsible to let you continue. I just prayed and prayed and prayed that we would all come out alive. It's all right, trust. Have faith, all right, sweetie. It'll be just fine. The dramatic conclusion, when it's a miracle, continues. You're out, love. What's the matter? In the fifth month of her pregnancy, Janice Topping developed pre-eclampsia, a toxic condition that could kill both mother and children if the babies weren't delivered immediately. But because their lungs were not fully developed, Janice refused to give birth, opting instead for a steroid treatment that would boost the baby's lung development. The process would take five days, five days that Janice might not survive. The doctor said my blood pressure was so high and my blood was so infected with toxins that it would obviously end up killing us, it was that bad. The doctors decided that enough was enough. That's it. We're going to have to deliver right now. The twins would just have to come there and then and we would just have to take the risk for the, for the twins to live. Janice was rushed into the operating room for an immediate C-section. And minutes later, Chelsea, a baby girl, entered the world at two pounds, five ounces, followed by her brother Daniel at two pounds, two ounces. The twins were quarantined in neonatal intensive care, and until Janice's internal organs began functioning properly, she would not be allowed to see them. But they did send us a Polaroid photograph of them, which are clutched all the time. The Polaroids meant everything, everything in the world. When I looked at these photographs, I was saying, are these really mine? Are these really mine? And it wouldn't click until I actually went along myself to see them. Six days later, Janice had recovered sufficiently to finally meet her babies face to face. Seeing them for the first time was 
sort of happiness but shock. Um, my heart was full of joy, but it was a shock. All you could do was put your hands through these two holes yeah. in the incubator and just touch them that way because they're so feminine, so small. In, in fact, I was really frightened to, to touch them anyway because you think, God, they're so small, are they going to break? Because when they were born so premature, they're born with no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no fingernails, no toenails, and their skin's very translucent. Sometimes I used to think myself, they look a bit like aliens, <laughs> but they were mine and I give them 100% love and hope that everything will be fine. In the weeks that followed, baby Chelsea grew in leaps and bounds. But for Daniel, every day was a struggle and doctors weren't sure he would live. Well, we are concerned about his pulmonary condition right now. But he's gonna be okay. Well, I can't give you a, an absolute answer on that. He has increased weight, which is a very good sign. Uh, but it's still touch and go. His lungs were too immature. He's got a um, chronic lung disease. And that put him on oxygen. Took him long at the start feeding off the bottle. It was just a waiting game all the time. Your heart was in your mouth all the time. Finally, seven weeks after her birth, Chelsea was deemed fit to leave the hospital. It was exciting taking Chelsea home, but also hurtful leaving Daniel behind. It was as if there was a piece missing. It was a jigsaw not done. Their hopes that Daniel would follow Chelsea home were dashed when he suffered a series of reversals. The doctors didn't really know why he was losing the weight and why he kept vomiting and things like that and why he wasn't sleeping. You'll be fine. He just screamed and screamed and screamed. It was just awful to look at him. He just didn't look well at all, but the doctors couldn't actually pinpoint what it was. It was Janice's mother who came up with one possible answer. Daniel missed his sister. I wonder if, if Chelsea was brought back here and put in with them, if that would make any difference. I don't think that would help. Me mum says with them being so young and not knowing anything else in the world, that's the only thing they've had, each other. Although bringing a healthy baby back into intensive care is risky because of the bacteria the baby could carry with it, doctors agreed to allow Chelsea back into ICU as long as she was carefully bathed beforehand. And as soon as she touched his hand, he woke up straight away, looked straight into her eyes, and it was sort of like a sigh of relief that she was there. You could tell by his eyes that he just kept on glazing at her, and you could just tell there was something there between them. They just used to lie there, touching each other all the time, like what they did in the womb, head to head, holding each other's hands, stroking each other's faces. Then they would both fall asleep together. Daniel began improving immediately, and the change was so remarkable that Janice brought Chelsea to the hospital every day. Because they were next to each other being fed together, he would take his bottles, um, he would sleep without crying, he hardly ever cried. He was just so settled. It was absolutely fantastic. I believe there was a miracle. I believe Chelsea um, saved Daniel. I, I do believe she saved his life. Five weeks after his reunion with Chelsea, Daniel arrived home weighing a hefty five pounds, five ounces. And when I actually got them home, it was like my last piece of me jigsaw. And it was all complete. Well, I didn't believe in miracles until now. Until they both came out of the hospital. I'm proud. Um, I love them both with all my heart. And, and just a joy to see them grow up day by day. It's just the most important thing in my life. This amazing story wouldn't be complete if we didn't take a moment to see how the twins are doing today. They're 11 months old, they weigh over 15 pounds each, and they join us now along with their parents from their home in Newcastle. Hey there. Hi, Hi Richard. Richard. So how are those two beautiful babies of yours doing? 
Um, as you can see, they're getting on really, really fine. Um, apart from Daniel, he's still got his oxygen supply for his bad chest. But other than that, they're getting on really, really fine. And how's Chelsea? Chelsea's doing fine. She's grown in leaps and bounds. Well, she has to be the youngest miracle worker we've ever had on our show. You still see that quality in her? Yeah, she's got a lot of character in her. A lot of love for Daniel. And she's my hero. And she's also my hero, too. Any thoughts on what made her a hero? Um, it was just the bond, the love. Um, as you can see, they've always got to touch each other. They've always got to be beside each other. Um, every time one of the twins leaves the room, my eyes follow or his eyes follow. It's just lovely to watch. It's absolutely fantastic. And I just hope the bond will last forever. Well, we do too. Thank you so much for sharing your wonderful story with us. OK, thank Thanks you, Richard. Bye. Bye. We'll be right back. England has given us one of the most famous Christmas stories of all time, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. In it, one man, uh, Mr. Scrooge, learns the true meaning of this sacred holiday. Well, we found another Christmas story that explores the spirit of giving. It may not have a Scrooge in it, but it does have a valuable lesson well worth learning. The gold mining town of Idaho City, Idaho is a nature lover's paradise. Gwen Ellis was born and raised there. What we like about it is just the peace and quiet, nature. We get elk come walking down the main street every now and then, and a bear or two in the neighbor's yards. It's just very relaxing and calming. We just love it. But with a population of less than 400, Idaho City is not an easy place to make a living, especially for a single mother raising two young girls alone. Gwen supported her family waitressing at a local cafe. I was just living basically on my tips and my wages. And sometimes it was very little on the tips. Here we go. There's your BLT and there's your patty melt. I would work eight-hour shifts, sometimes 12, 13-hour shifts, and then come home and do another eight hours of being a mother and keeping home. It was pretty hard. And still, Gwen's children, 10-year-old Kristen and 7-year-old Jamie, were happy and thriving. Hi, Mom. Hi, how are you? How's it going? Good. Good. You made dinner? Oh, thank you. Despite the hardships, I think it brings a family closer together. Like we all pitch in together, help each other. I think that makes a family. Did you guys take your medicines today? No. No, you forgot. Money became an even greater issue when Jamie, Gwen's youngest, contracted pneumonia. Can I skip it one day? No, no, no. That's why. She stayed in the hospital for a week. And then she was on medicines for a couple months after Get that. Something to drink with it. That just kind of broke the bank. And the bank stayed broken. Even after Jamie recovered, Gwen was forced to constantly juggle the books to stay afloat. My bills every month would over exceed my income. I'd try and keep smiling and laughing to keep the girls happy, but I would cry myself to sleep at nights. Our budget was so tight that I was really worried I wasn't going to be able to have a Christmas for the girls. Mom, can we get a new soccer ball? It's really flat. Well, I don't know if we can do it right now. How about for Christmas? We'll have to just wait and see. Kristen and Jamie weren't as worried about Christmas. They knew they'd find their mother a special gift. They were always bringing her little treasures they'd found. Hey, Mom. What? Look what I found. What do you got? It's a present. What is it? A lost treasure. <laughs> wow, it's a nice one. Good job finding it. What oh, I've got little pieces of driftwood, okay. different types of little rocks, little willows that are bent and curled, you know, and tied together. We usually bring stuff home when we think it's unique or pretty or stuff like that. These small gifts were enough for Gwen. 
but she hated the thought of her girls going without Christmas presents. And there was no reason to believe that the situation would change before the holidays. I was pretty sure that Christmas was going to be pretty null and void. It was going to be pretty sad on my part because I couldn't give the kids presents. I did a lot of praying. The Lord showed me one day at a time, you know, we will receive our gifts. And our gifts from Him was the love that we had for each other. And so Gwen decided that even if they had to eat macaroni for Christmas, they would find joy in the spirit of the holiday rather than material gifts. What matters is giving the love from yourself to someone else. That's the most important thing. And then, on the first day of December, something remarkable happened. Kristen and Jamie were playing in the schoolyard during recess when they found another little treasure. I really thought it was unique because it's hard to find a rock that color in a playground, so I put it in my pocket. When Gwen arrived home that day, the girls presented her with an early Christmas present. Why are you home so early? It was so slow that they closed early. How are you guys Sorry. doing? Look, we found this at school. Yeah. What did you find? What is it? It's a pretty rock. It's a really pretty rock. I looked at it, and I was shocked. Where did you find this at? I didn't believe I was looking at what I was looking at. Look, it's gold. We don't find oh. gold at school yards. It's shiny it's rock. Gold. Feel it. I knew it was gold right off the bat, because working in the mines with my grandfather when I was young. It's gold. You bet it is. I knew that's what it was. I knew that it would change everything. I think our prayers are answered in one way or another, and this little gold nugget was the answer to our prayers. Weighing nearly a full ounce, the nugget eventually brought more than $300 into the Ellis family coffers, but it gave them something more, something money couldn't buy. I think that was one of the best Christmases the girls had had. It meant more knowing that our prayers were answered and that we were able to have a wonderful Christmas. I actually think that we do have guardian angels by our sides and they were watching out for us. Hey, you guys, here you go. I call it a miracle because of the hardships that the girls and I did go through and I myself relying on my faith. I call it a miracle. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Anyway. We'll be back right after this. Well, according to Big Ben, our time is nearly up. I want to thank you for joining us and a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories with us on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life too. I'm Richard Thomas. Goodbye.